So in the last video, we talked about the assumption of the logit model, that all of our random unobserved utility terms are IID, type one extreme value. And the reason we made that, we, that we make that assumption is that it gives us some really simple closed form uh, expressions for choice probabilities. So let's look at what those are. So just remind ourselves here, the uh, mathematically, the choice probability, well, let's first redefine choice probability. That's the probability that a decision maker is gonna choose any particular alternative. Because we have this random uh, utility term, we can't say for certain which alternative a decision maker is gonna choose, but we can say what the probability is of them choosing each alternative. And so that's what we express here as capital P. Capital P sub NI is the probability that decision maker N chooses alternative I. And that's just the probability that, that I gives more utility than every, other, than every other alternative. Well, we model utility as being capital V, representative utility, plus epsilon, this random unobserved utility term. So we can just plug those in. And we, we, we have the same expression here. We've just, we've just substituted in uh, two, two, two new variables on each side. And now let's rewrite this. Let's actually just put epsilon sub nj on the left-hand side and, and then the other three terms on the right-hand side. So we're, we're not doing anything fancy here. We're just plugging in and then re, uh, just kind of reformulating this a little bit. So epsilon sub nj. The, the random unobserved utility from alternative J is by itself on the left-hand side. All right, now let's, let's stop for a second and suppose that we know random utility for I, random utility for J, uh, sorry, representative utility I, representative utility for J, and random utility for I. So we know everything on the right-hand side. We, we don't, right? We, we, we think that epsilon ni is also random, but for just a second, let's suppose that we know it, like just for kind of a thought experiment here, let's suppose that we know it. So we know everything on the right-hand side. Then what is this? This is the probability that some random variable is less than some known number. Let's think about just one j. Let, let's ignore the for all j not equal to i also for a second then we're just saying, what's the probability that some random variable is less than some number? That's a cumulative distribution. That's just the definition of a cumulative distribution. And we've assumed that this epsilon sub nj is type one extreme value. So we know it's cumulative distribution. And so we can just say right here that, that this probability, conditional on knowing epsilon sub ni, which we're assuming for a second that we do, then the probability that any one j satisfies this expression is just the cumulative distribution of a type one extreme value random variable. So we know what that is. If we just had one j and we knew epsilon sub ni, we could calculate this thing, easy. All right, but we, pro we almost always have more than one j. So we need to know this prob probability for all j not equal to i, not just a single j but we've assumed all of those epsilons are IID. In particular, they're independent and they're also identically distributed. So all of the J's are gonna take this format. The probability of, of any epsilon being less than that right-hand side is gonna take this format. And because they're independent, we can take the probability of all of them by just taking the product of, of, of all of them together. So, the probability, once again, conditional on knowing epsilon sub ni, which is not realistic, but we're taking that as, a, as our starting point here, conditional on knowing that, the probability of decision maker n choosing alternative i is this product term right here. It's the product over all j of the cumulative distribution of a type one extreme value random variable. Okay, this is still something, it's gotten a little more complicated, but still, if I gave you all of these numbers on the right-hand side, you could just calculate this thing. Like in, you wouldn't even need fancy software. You could do it in Excel or something like that. You could do it with a calculator, conceivably. All right, but we're still making a simplifying assumption, right? We're saying that is true conditional on knowing epsilon sub ni. 
but epsilon sub ni is a random variable. We don't actually know it. So we have to integrate over that density. So we have to take the probability conditional on knowing epsilon sub ni, plug it in here, but then we also need to integrate over the entire density of epsilon sub ni. So we need to take that thing, multiply it by the density of epsilon sub ni, which is given here, just the, the probability density of a type one extreme value, uh, random variable, and then integrate over all of that. So this is kind of like where, uh, you know, this is like the discrete analog here is saying, we're gonna calculate this thing for every possible value of epsilon sub ni, and then multiply it by the probability of epsilon sub ni, actually taking that value and then add them all up. That's like the, it's a continuous variable, so that's not exactly the right way to describe it, but I think that's probably the easiest kind of discrete analog to think about. All right, so I said, we're gonna end up with a simple expression for choice probabilities. This thing looks pretty messy. We did not, this does not look any simpler, right? Well, it turns out, and the math is in your textbook, in the train textbook, and I'll point you there if you want to see all the steps, but this kind of messy integral expression simplifies to the second line right here. The probability of choosing, of, of decision maker n choosing alternative i is just the exponential of i's representative utility divided by the sum of the exponentials uh, of, of the representative utility summed over all alternatives. So it's this, you know, this is nonlinear, uh, but once again, if I gave you all the re representative utility values, you could just calculate this thing in, in Excel or with a calculator or something. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna go into the proof here. Uh, it's in the textbook if you wanna take a look. But, but I think we can all agree, this expression right here is way simpler than any of the kind of integral, multi-dimensional integrals that we were talking about last week when we were talking about random utility models. So by making that logit assumption, now the probability that n chooses i is this closed form expression that depends on the representative utility. And remember the representative utility depends on the observable attributes of all the alternatives. So this is something we can just calculate if we had all the, the data and, and, and parameters. There are a couple of nice prob uh, properties that we can see from this expression. So first of all, uh, these choice probabilities are always within the range of zero to one. If a given alternative's representative utility goes to infinity, the probability of that alternative goes to one. And if a given alternative's representative utility goes to negative infinity, the probability goes to zero. We're just always constrained to be within zero and one, which is a nice property when we're thinking about probabilities that should always be between zero and, and one. Uh, also, the choice probabilities are always gonna sum up to one. The sum over all alternatives of the numerator is equal to the denominator. And so we just get to one, uh, which is nice. If, if we've set up our discrete models, uh, our, our discrete choice model, so that all of our, our, our choices, our choice set or all of all our alternatives are, uh, exhaustive and mutually exclusive, we would expect that summing over all of them should get us to 100%, one, one uh, probability. And that's what we have here. Also, it's a little less obvious, but we have this kind of interesting uh, property that the choice probabilities have a, uh, a sigmoidal function of representative utility. You can kind of flip back to the logistic CDF if you want to see an example of what I mean by the, the sigmoidal shape, but kind of a an S, S shape. Uh, and what that means is that marginal effects are small when probabilities are close to zero or one. In other words, if, if a decision maker has a really low probability of choosing something or a really high probability, changing our data a little bit isn't going to have much of an effect on that choice probability. But if a decision maker has a marginal, uh, uh, has a, uh, a choice probability close to 50%, a small change in the data could actually swing things a lot one direction or another. And that's just an interesting aspect of, of the shape of, uh, of the choice probabilities here. Now, one more thing. Uh, a lot of times we're gonna assume representative utility is uh, linear in parameters. I think we talked about this last week. It's a, pretty, uh, it's a pretty standard assumption. It really simplifies things and yet it still kind of uh, covers a lot of possible 
uh, kind of utility representations. So if we make that assumption that, that a given alternative's representative utility is just beta times x, then we can express choice probabilities uh, in this way right here that's shown in the middle of the screen. And so now I think it makes it even more clear the choice probability of any alternative is going to be a function of some parameters that we need to estimate. And then the data about each of the alternatives, alternative i, and then down here, all of the j's in the denominator. Just a few reminders about these parameters and about our estimation. Uh, when we're using linear representative utility, like, like like I have expressed here, uh, these structural parameters are typically going to give us the marginal utility of attributes, characteristics, etc. Um, if we use a different model of representative utility, we can get some different structural parameters. The book actually has an example of this where um, their, the representative utility is nonlinear and it's based on kind of a trade-off between uh, leisure and consumption that, that, that the model is kind of built into the, this bigger, broader model of utility. Uh, so that's a good place you can check out to see how we might get some different parameters. But everything we're going to do in here is just linear to keep things simple. Uh, and then ultimately, we want to find the parameter values that make choice probabilities consistent with observed choices. So what I mean by that, once again, is when we actually see someone choose an alternative, we want that choice probability to be close to one. And we want the other choice probabilities to be close to zero. And so you can see here, we observe not choice probabilities, but we, we, we observe the actual choice and we observe these X's on the right hand side. And ultimately what we want to do is figure out what, uh, what beta parameter values are going to make these choice probabilities consistent with those observed choices. All right, so that's it on choice probabilities. Next up, we're going to talk about the binary logit model, a specific kind of logit model where we only have two alternatives to choose from.